real estate brokerage. This is a little bit of what she talked about tonight. Um, actually becoming a broker, what is a brokerage? Um, and within a brokerage company, no matter how small or large it is, each real estate professional has an individual business. So when you work for a broker, you are a contract employee, basically. You're working for yourself. You're giving them a split of commissions. Economics, personal, personal decisions are part of running a business, and a successful real estate professional needs to think like a business person. Part of what those classes are, that Tipsy Klein gives you, the Spark classes and the other things, those are things to help you realize your potential, to help you survive in this world where it's commission only, to help you generate ideas. It's very important that you find a broker that has that support network to help you be successful because if, if, there, if you don't have a support network, unless you're just a blessed salesperson, you won't make it. So you have to have that support network in that brokerage company. And that's why she gives you the sheet of questions, things to ask people that you're going to ask them before you become associated with them. So we're going to talk about fundamentals of brokerage, licensing laws, describe the pur purpose and basic elements of antitrust laws. Okay. She showed you a slide tonight where Sipsy Klein charges 7%. I did not ask her, does Sipsy Klein always charge 7%? Why does Sipsy Klein charge 7%? Other companies only charge 6 or 5 I didn't ask her any of those questions because it's not my place to ask that to her. Now, this is a different forum, but if this was a board of realtors meeting, we could never even talk about commission because that violates antitrust laws. When she advertises that Sipsy Klein always asks for 7%, that tells everybody in the community that that's what the going rate is for city client services. It doesn't mean that's what it's got to be. Commissions are negotiable, but city client asks for 7%. Cincinnati is the highest commission market of anywhere in the country. What? Most comp places are only six or 5%. And since, and I thought Cincinnati, when she, I saw that slide that said 7%, I honestly thought it's been a while since I've been in residential. Because for a long time, I thought residential in Cincinnati was still only 6%. It, everybody had dropped to more of the national norm. But for a long time, Cincinnati was 7 and we were the highest price market. That's good for you if you're an agent. You get a little more money. But our, our real estate also is relatively good value for the money, too. So you're not making, we're not doing huge transactions all the time. Um, we're going to talk about basic elements, antitrust laws, price fixing, boycotts, allocations, the markets, things like that. Explain how real estate professionals should use technology. Next week's guest lecture is coming from Dot Loop. Hunter Morgan is going to be here. He'll bring dinner. Next week, he usually brings sub sandwiches. Um, and he'll be here for about an hour and a half at least. And you want to keep him longer, maybe, because he's going to talk to you about technology and real estate. And what Dot Loop Company has done as a company, they have basically taken the entire real estate contracting process and made it on the internet. And everybody has access to it now. Buyers, sellers, the attorneys, anybody who's involved in transaction through this dot loop account, everybody can see the entire contracting process and what's involved. In my day when we started, we were driving contracts back and forth across town. We didn't have fax machines. We were literally driving contracts back and forth across town. We had 24 to 48 hours to get back to somebody. So we were driving them suckers everywhere. Then when fax machines came out, we started faxing contracts everywhere. Fax machines, um, I got my first Quip machine in the mid-80s, and that was before fax machines were out. And a Quip machine took six minutes to burn a page, literally burn a page, and the whole office stunk. You, you, took, you got a phone call from somebody that said they were going to clip something to you, you stuck your little handset in there, and then this page would spin and burn on this special paper and burn the image. And they stunk the whole office smell. So, I mean, we have come a long way in our world of using technology and the real estate business. So, Dot Loop started a couple years ago, and it was the whole thing. I said, wait a minute, we should be able to have this whole contracting process, one place where everybody who's involved in the transaction can see everything that has to happen. That didn't happen until recently. You guys will start in this business and you'll take all that for granted, but it really has just happened recently. So license laws, the purpose of licensing laws. We need to establish basic requirements for licenses. Why is this? It's consumerism at its best. We need to protect consumers because real estate is the biggest asset they will buy, and most people don't understand what they're buying, other than the fact that they're buying a house. 
They don't understand anything about the transaction process. We talked about agency disclosure. When somebody represents one person, who's at an advantage when somebody else has another person representing them? All of these things about the real estate process are subject to license laws. Every state has them. They're very similar from state to state, but every state has their own real estate commission that governs their licensing laws. Some states allow you to have reciprocity with other states. In Kentucky, I'm an Ohio broker, been an Ohio broker for a long time. To get a Kentucky broker's license, all I had to do was take a test. If I was an Ohio agent and I wanted to get a Kentucky agent's license, I would have had to take a 40-hour class. So every state has different requirements about what they accept reciprocity or not. Years ago, Ohio used to have reciprocity, West Virginia, New York, Indiana, and Kentucky. And now we don't have, reciprocity just meant if you had it in one state, you literally could fill out paperwork and transfer your license, get a license in the other state. Pay your fees, you can be licensed in another state. Over time, those reciprocity laws have closed in. So they don't allow people to move back and forth from state to state as easy anymore. Um, I don't know if you want to cover this, but when you say broker and you say agent, mm -hmm. um, like what would you say which one is like, um, I don't know, what's the difference? An agent is somebody that you're going to be when you begin to take and you get your real estate license. You've taken four basic real estate classes, you've taken a test, you've passed it. You're an agent okay. when you're affiliated with a broker. You're an agent. As an agent, you have to be affiliated with a broker to be in practice to do your business. As a broker, you've taken at least six real estate classes. You've had at least 75 lease transactions, at least 25 sale transactions. You have done your time to become experienced, to become a market. You've taken a whole separate exam for the broker exam. But when you're a broker, you can hang your own shingle. You don't have to work for somebody else. So the broker is the top piece. That's the highest point of what you can do in real estate. I'm sorry, when you say like how many? 75? 75 lease transactions, 25 sale. It might be only 20 sale transactions now, but you have to have a minimum number of transactions. They want you to have a minimum number of experience. When you take the broker's exam, a big part of the broker's exam is you have a closing statement. You have to be able to do all the math for that closing statement. And that math, they take you down the wrong road. They figure it wrong, and you can keep going all the way down the road and figure it wrong, and you can miss all those six questions on that broker on that piece of the broker's exam. Um, and the broker's exam is segments as well, but again, it's taking additional real estate classes and getting experience to be able to, to, to be qualified to sit for a broker's exam. There's no fee difference in the state of Ohio. There is no fee difference between me being a licensed agent or a broker. When I pay my annual renewal or triannual renewal fees in the state of Ohio, there is, sorry, it's a small difference. But to belong to the Board of Realtors, broker agent, 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 it's not a lot different. So agents and um, brokers are both realtors? Yes, we're all realtors. I'm a broker with a company called JLL. JLL holds my broker's license, but I am not the principal broker. I don't sign paperwork for the JLL office here in Cincinnati. The principal broker does that. The but principal broker. Hmm? I, yeah, I took my broker's test in 87. Oh, I did my right. license test in 83. I did my broker's <clears throat> test in 87. Okay. So I've had it for a long, long time. So you got to really, you got to renew your broker's license? I have to renew my broker's license every three years just as if I was a real estate agent. Agents and brokers have to renew their license every three years. We all have to take 30 hours of education every three years, regardless of broker agent. That's a requirement because they want you to stay current. It's consumerism. They want us to understand what's going on with law, fair housing, ethics. That's nine hours. The other 21 hours is general real estate education. And they make you do that every three years and submit that paperwork every three years to the High Commission. Question. What I'm doing now is um, I, I'm basically... I was told that I needed to be licensed in Ohio and licensed in Kentucky to be a property manager. And because I had a broker's license in Ohio, they said, we want you to get your Kentucky license. You have 120 days to do it okay. after they hired me. Mm -hmm. For me, yeah, as to be a property manager to sign contracts. Because I'm signing contracts um, for my 
I don't sign the leases, but I sign service contracts. I commit us to payments. So to be a property manager, you have a broker? Agent license. license. You only need to be an agent. You have to have a broker record. So you sign a contract with other be a licensed agent. No, you have to be a licensed agent, but you have to have a broker shop. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. So like yeah, the, you have to be affiliated with a broker to sign contracts because you're doing fiduciary responsibilities. Okay. Okay. I'm negotiating for snow removal, for cleaning, for landscaping, for everything you can think about for the property services. I don't sign the leases, but I do damn near everything else. <laughs> and the other, the actual owners of the property sign the leases. They have their own people to sign the leases. So with licenses, um, you've got basic requirements. You have, again, Ohio, you have to take these four classes. You have to have a sponsorship to be able to get, to sit for your license and pay your fee. And in Cincinnati it, State, it's only three classes, but the one class is two classes. They've combined it. So that's the four classes that you have to take. After you get that license, you have 12 hours of education you're going to have to do in the next two years. Mandated courses. Then after that, every three years, you have 30 hours that you're going to have to do every three years. You said four hours? 12 hours. 12 hours in two years. After you get licensed, you have 12 hours. There are specific classes, ethics, and some other classes that they make you take. So that's the online your broker okay Sipsy Klein the $250 you pay one time at Sipsy Klein they have all kinds of continuing education classes they offer them all the time but you need to pay $250 and, and be one of their agents basically to take those continuing education classes to take the prep class that's any and everybody but to take those continuing education classes those spark classes the other classes they're doing that's part of being a Sipsy agent so that's part of one of the questions you're going to ask a broker is, how are you going to help me do my community education? How are you going to help me keep my license? What do you have available to me? Don't tell me I can go online and take online anytime I want. What resources do you have? Will you pay part of that? Okay, so at JLL, JLL paid for me to sit for my Kentucky broker's license. They paid for me to take the computer class that I just took my Excel class that I sat with your partner in. That was $395, but I got computer education for it, so they paid for me to take that class for two days um, because it's a requirement of my job to be there. So they pay for my computer education. Agents, when you're contracting, they don't pay for your computer education, but you want them to have resources to help you get your computer education. I'm an employee. That's why some of my stuff gets paid because I'm told I have to do this. Okay, so what activities require licensing? Any okay, she talked about this. Crazy. Appraising requires it, but to have an open house, mm -hmm. you have to be licensed. Mm -hmm. So one of the mm -hmm. things she talked, you can't just have your real realtor assistant hold your open houses unless your realtor assistant is licensed. They used to let them do it. They don't anymore because buyers and sellers are walking through the door, yeah. and you're still representing the seller when you're holding an open house, and you're courting buyers. So they want you to be licensed to do that. It makes sense when you think about it, but for years, the assistants were not licensed. You can still have an assistant today that's not licensed, but they're keeping books for you. They're doing the marketing for you. They're doing anything but talking. They can't talk to your clients. They can answer some questions over the phone, but very few. You have to be licensed. They like barely. Yeah, yeah. Right. So there's. You'll read about what license, you know, what activities require licensing, but it's gotten stricter and stricter because, again, it's consumerism. We're protecting the people that are out there buying homes. We want them to understand what's going on. It's a big, you know, you're making a huge commitment to buy a home. Describe standards of conduct and practices and enforcing standards through, through disciplinary action. We have disciplinary action that can happen. Okay, so real estate broker is licensed to buy, sell, exchange, or lease real property for others and to charge a fee for those services. That's our whole job. We're bringing buyers and sellers together or tenants together, and we're charging a fee based on our agreement on how we're going to work for them. 
The broker and sales associate, um, a real estate salesperson is licensed to perform real estate activities on behalf of a broker. So when she said you're going out to office managers, you're actually meeting office managers, some of those office managers may not be brokers, but they're the ones running those 60 client offices that you're going to go talk to. They're the ones that are going to coach and help you get through stuff. They act like the broker. If they're not a broker, they'll get the broker to sign paperwork. Most of them have been to a broker or close to a broker by the time they're running an office because it's just it's a lot of work. And when they run an office, they don't have time to be selling houses. That's why it's kind of like a pyramiding thing. They want to hire people that can do the sales while they run the office. It takes a lot of time to be back at the office doing all that paperwork, getting all, keeping all that stuff together. The broker for whom the salesperson works is called the employing, employee broker, and both will be subject terms of an employment agreement, even when the salesperson is an independent contractor for tax and other purposes. So most of our agents are independent contractors. They don't have any taxes withheld when they get paid their commissions. So what does that mean? You get, well, you get paid $3,000. What should you do with $1,000? Put it in savings. Put it in savings. Because guaranteed that thousand bucks is going to be taxed. Hmm? As an independent contract, you pay your own taxes. So anytime you sell a house and you collect a fee, you should put a third of that fee into savings. That's your IRS fund. Well, you can file quarterly. You can do all kinds of things, but begin no understand. At the end of the year, when you file your taxes, you're going to owe taxes based on what you say you made. And you need to say what you say you made because you're going to get a 1099 from your broker at the end of the year. There's proof. There is paperwork that flows. Uh, so you can also like, write off the whole Oh, there's all kinds of stuff you're going to write off as an independent contractor. Oh, tons. But still, you want to set aside a third of that money. Because unless you have a ton of write-offs, you're going to still owe money. You're going to still owe money. Absolutely. So, again, the broker and the salesperson, employing broker, but they do have a sales, an independent contractor agreement. And they will get a 1099 in a year. So an employee, she was an employee. She works as a salaried employee of Sipsy Klein in their office as a recruiter. She helps do different things. She's basically paid 40 hours a week to work. All those people she talked about that support you, the photographers, the marketing people, the trainers that Sipsy Klein has, those are employees. They're not out selling the business. So that fee, that 50% fee you're giving Sipsy Klein, that pays for her. That pays for all those people that support you. So it's an expensive business to run. As an employee, you have rules for working hours, office routines, attendance at meetings, sales quotas, dress codes as an employee. As an independent contractor, you don't get benefits. You set your own rules. They will have sales goals because that's how they assess how you're working. If, you, if you're not meeting sales goals, the thought is, is you're not going to last long in the business. So you're going to have sales goals. But they're mutually agreed upon. They're not saying, oh, you've got to do this. They're agreed upon. They ask you to do a few hours of phone service or office time every month. Again, most people will tell you. That if they spend eight hours in the office a month, they won't get eight calls, eight pieces of business for that eight hours. But the one or two pieces of business that they get is worth spending some time in the office because they're there answering phones. When they answer phones, they're answering phones for Joyce Smith broker, Joyce Smith agent. Somebody calls and they say, well, I'm asking for Joyce because she's my agent. Oh, sorry. Well, I'll take a message. I'll help you out. But they call and they say, you know, I don't have an agent yet. And then that's when they say, well, do you need an agent? What can I do to help you? So they're taking those general inquiries and turning them into their sales leads. That's part of that phone time. But they do set their own rules. Now, there are sales meetings. There are coaching sessions. There are other things that go on in an office. They expect you as an independent contractor to do some of that stuff. But they're not telling you to come into work at 8 o'clock in the morning. When they have those kind of things, they're doing them at 10 o'clock. They're doing them a little later in the day when you can reasonably get there. As an eight, that's one of the reasons you're an independent agent. You do not want to be an eight to five kind of job. That's not what you're doing. That's not your life goal. So you're setting some of your own times and stuff too. A real estate assistant. They can be licensed or unlicensed. 
but that's where the state laws are going to come in and say what they're allowed to do, specifically what they can and can't do if they're licensed or unlicensed. An unlicensed person can do a lot of legwork, but they cannot talk to people directly. They can't work open houses. The assistant can be paid an hourly wage from the agents they work for. Oh, okay. And I guarantee you they're not getting paid $25 an hour. They're getting something like 10 or 15 an hour. Or they might give them a percentage of what they make. Again, it, the assistant that works for an agent, they have their own agreement. Okay. So it's not my But no, they're typically paid by the agent. The assistant works for the agent is paid by the agent. Somebody else have a question? Okay, I covered it. I covered it. So real estate broker's compensation. It's specified in the contract with the client. So I go to sit down with a client. I tell them I'm going to sell their house. I'm a Sipsy client, and I'm going to get 7% for selling your house. You might negotiate me down to 6 as the seller, but that's what the broker's contract is saying. The contract that I have as the agent to sell your house is actually my broker contract. My broker is actually signing part of that contract. I'm out there working for that broker, getting that listing agreement for the house as the agent, but the broker's involved in it. So the commissions, the fees are all specified in that contract. The, the rules of engagement, what the sellers are supposed to do, what the, the agent is supposed to do is part of that contract, part of that sales presentation as well. The procuring costs. When, when I started in this business, we called the procuring cause the threshold theory. So this is what I want you to remember, the threshold theory. When, what's a threshold? Architects in the class, what's a threshold? A threshold. The door. Across the door is the threshold. The piece of, usually the little strip of wood or whatever you walk across is the threshold. So we call this the threshold theory, meaning as the broker, or excuse me, as the agent, when you brought your buyer through the house, you thresholded them through the door. Threshold theory. When you walked into somebody's house to make the sales presentation, a listing presentation, you literally were going across the threshold to come into their house. So that's why we call it threshold theory. The person that brought the person through the door, first contact through the door, was the first in, person that was procuring costs. Today we call procuring cause the person that planted the seed to get the activity to happen. How can you plant a seed to get activity to happen today? You can post stuff on the internet. You can put a for sale sign up. You can talk to people. Phone calls. You know, all kinds of ways. But those, you're the procuring cause when you planted the seed to start the sales transaction. When you brought that buyer and seller together from whatever it was you did, to bring that buyer and seller together, you became the procuring cause. This is one of the biggest fights between agents. This, and when agent, agents fight among agents, they go do it at the Board of Realtors. They have, they, when they are members of the Board of Realtors, they agree to sit before Board of Realtors um, hearing board that will hear their complaints about their activities. And that's the court of law for the agents. Um, they don't typically take this kind of stuff to court. They go to the Board of Realtors to have their complaints heard. Um, and procuring causes one of the biggest pieces where they feel like they stepped on somebody and took the sale away from them. It's a big, you know, realtors tend to be very confidential about the business they know. And that's one of those things when you're working office hours, you got to ask all the questions. Are you being represented by somebody? Do, you know, is there somebody associated with this? You're covering your butt before you take them over and say, hey, you're going to be my client. You want to make sure you've asked all those questions. Um, so you become the procuring cause. You're guaranteed that, that you're going to do that. Now, finally, to get the sale, you have to produce the ready, willing, and able buyer. Ready, willing, and able means they went under contract. They <coughs> signed the contract. They qualified. They were able to get financing. They were able to do everything to clear the hurdle. Now, you might not have a closing for a couple other reasons, but they did everything to clear the hurdle to make that transaction happen. That's ready, willing, and able to buy a house. At that point in time, as a realtor, you've earned your commission. How can a sale fall apart at the last minute? 
Somebody could lose a job. The seller can decide not to sell for some ungodly reason. And yes, that happens. And yes, they might get sued for it, but they could decide not to sell. That's out of your control as a realtor. You do not control that. But did you earn a commission? Absolutely. Absolutely. You might have to sue for it, yes. But you did earn a commission by from that whole process from happening. People lose jobs, death in family, other things that divorces, things that happen totally out of your control. But some of these things that happen may mean that you're still entitled to a commission. It sucks life happens that way, but you still might be entitled to that commission. Sales associates compensation is a hundred percent commission. But all those other people that work at 50 clients are salaried employees. They're there to support agents. The agents are 100% commission. Commission splits, this is the conversation you want to have with the agents. Remax is not a 50-50 split. Remax is much higher, but you pay desk fees, you pay some advertising costs, you pay more upfront fees, but you keep more of your commission. Other companies work different ways. This is part of your conversation with your broker, your sponsor. How do they work that? I don't understand. Like, this client has said seven percent, mm -hmm. but that covered. I think it was four percent selling. Okay. When you're the listing five. agent, when you're the listing agent, you get four percent. You're considered the selling agent, listing agent. When you're the buyer's agent, you get three percent. Because the buyer's agent didn't have all that money spent to advertise, promote the house, and do all that. So our buyer's agents understand we don't have to work as hard to bring our buyers to the table. Right. But so. But mostly, if, if it's 6%, it's 50 50. It's split. Right. But so, so, but you were saying not all brokers charge 7%. No. So if the listing agent is the client, buying agent is Huff, and Huff is typically 6%, 6%. Like, how does that work to whoever was listed? Well, whoever was a lister, but it's also part of that offer to buy the house. They're going to put, Huff's going to put what they think their fee should be in that offer to buy the house. So the two agents are going to negotiate. That's another piece of the wholesale transaction you guys missed. It happened behind the <laughs> under the rug. Those two agents were negotiating how they were going to get paid, but they're not supposed to stop the transaction from happening. Typically, when there's a, an odd score, it's not it's an even number. The listing agent generally keeps more because we understand and appreciate the listing agent had to spend money to advertise the property. But if it's a six percent, generally it's three three, and if it's a listing agent. Some people, this is the reason they're buyer's agents only, because they feel like if they're working with a buyer, there's a 90% chance they're going to close the sale, because they have that ready, willing, able buyer all the time, but they also feel they don't have to work as hard, because they don't have to do all the marketing to sell a piece of real estate. One of the reasons I did buyer, I did buyer brokerage on the commercial side, because we thought that when we worked with the people that wanted to find office space, buy it, lease it, whatever, Again, 90% sure we were going to have somebody that wanted something done. We weren't putting our marketing signs all over property. You don't see Cresta, you didn't see Cresta signs all over the city. Nobody knew who we were because we weren't spending money on billboards. We weren't marketing property. I didn't have to do monthly sales reports to property owners. I just had to bring the people in through the door that wanted to lease something. If someone comes to you and they want you to be the listing agent and their house is a wreck and there are all kinds of reasons why you can say I do not want to sell your house that's one of them <laughs> that's one of them. another one is if you find somebody that's telling you to do something that's unethical or a fair housing violation but if you feel you have people that are just asking an unreasonable let's say they have a beautiful house but they're asking an unreasonable price for it, and they will not get off that rock. They won't come down. They won't be reasonable. Why would you take the listing? You're never going to get it sold. That's a waste of your time. Time and money. Time. Well, time is money when you're doing this stuff. Every minute you're spending with somebody that's not going to do a transaction is, is money you lost doing something somewhere else. So there's many reasons you will walk away and not take a sale listing. But now, on the other hand, 
that house is a wreck, but they're ready to give it away. Okay, we can work with that. Yeah, we'll figure out how to price it right so it'll move. It'll move as a rent a wreck, but we can make that house move, and, and we might even get that thing sold in a couple of days because they're willing to give it away. So you want to feel that out, too. But the unreasonable buyer, the unreasonable seller, do you really want to work for them? Do you really want to stress yourself out like that? Not really. Not really. And the other thing about buyers, okay, in in commercial real estate, when I have buyers, they signed a contract that said I was going to work for them. In residential real estate, when I have buyers, you very seldom get them to sign a contract. You take them around in the car, you show them house, you show them house, you show them house. One day they go in an open house, they decide they're going to buy that house, they cut you out of the deal. Do they feel like they owe you something for all your time? Hell no. Um, but in commercial, I was protected that way. In residential real estate, you don't always get protected that You ask them to sign a buying agreement and commit that you're, they're going to be your agent. My son and daughter-in-law are looking for a house. And we went and looked at one house, one agent. We looked at another house, another agent. I finally said to Maggie, my daughter-in-law, Maggie, do you actually have an agent? Well, we're just doing this, doing that. I said, no, Maggie. When you have an agent, you get a stack of their business cards. And when you go and you find houses you want, you say, this agent works for me. And you take their business cards and give them to them. You be loyal to that agent that's taking you around and taking their time to help you. They're going to want be the ones that will negotiate the best price and ultimately the best deal for you because they're loyal to you. That's another question I had about, um, you know, people acting as dual agents and the whole kind of, unspoken contract with an agent, um, you know, if you go into an open house, you know, that's the selling agent, but... We'll talk about dual agency. There's another chapter about it. Okay. I mean, before I bought a house, I didn't know the whole, like... The whole reason that's, dual that's agency like, came to exist. When I started this business in the early 1980s, everybody worked for the seller. The seller paid the commission, everybody worked for the seller. Today, the seller still pays the commission, but everybody doesn't work for the seller because we now have dual agency. That didn't come into play until the late 80s, early 90s, where we actually had this paper that we had to hand somebody and say, there's this thing called agency disclosure. I'm either working for the buyer and I'm negotiating on the buyer's behalf, or I'm working for the seller, I'm negotiating on the seller's behalf. Or, oops, stop, wait a minute, I just declared dual agency. I actually am working for both of you, but I can no longer negotiate on your behalf. As a dual agent, all I can do is carry paperwork back and forth. Mm -hmm. I can advise individually, but I can't negotiate the sale. Because it seems like a selling agent that has people coming to an open house that don't have a broker or a, an agent already, you know, you would want to get that commission. Okay, why do agents hold open houses? And, and they're going to get new clients that are not interested in buying that house. Most open houses, you'll be lucky to get the house sold from the open house. I had a house in Marymount when I was in the trust department. I knew that if I had an open house on a Friday night, I would have multiple offers on Monday because of that neighborhood, because of where it was. And I told my boss, I said, I'm not going to employ an agent. I used to employ agents to sell houses for me. I said, I know this area well enough. I said, I'm just going to hold the open house on Monday. Let's see what happens. And I did. I had three offers on Monday. The, everybody that made offers knew that I was the trust department, selling for the trust department. And by the way, I was not selling as an agent. I was selling as the real estate manager of the trust department. I was employed doing that work. And they knew that I was working on behalf of the homeowner. That was my fiduciary responsibility. And a couple of them brought agents. One of them didn't have an agent. We just looked at every contract for what it was. Who was the high bidder? Who was the one we wanted to buy the house? So, but again, that was a, a different thing that happened there. Um, you work at open house to get buyers. You're, you're out there promoting your name, your image. But when people come to the house, yeah, new buyers, they don't have a clue who works for who. And that's why before you even take their information, you need to tell them up front. This is the rule of agency disclosure. You're, you need to tell those people up front. Before they give you anything that's confidential, you need to say, stop, wait a minute. I need you to know I work for the seller. And the seller 
has not allowed me to do dual agency. I'm only going to work for the seller. When you have a listing appointment with the people to sell their house, you're going to talk to them about dual agency at that time too. And you're going to say, there might be an opportunity where I could become a dual agent and I can represent both sides. How do you feel about that? At that time, they can tell you whether they approve it or not. That's your dual agency conversation with the seller. Your dual agency conversation with the buyer is the moment they start to come to you and they want to give you confidential information. You need to say, stop, wait a minute. You need to know who I'm working for. Don't tell me something that will give those people an advantage when I'm working for them. And that's the whole idea. It's the confidential information that you can share. So when you become a dual agent, you can literally, all you can do is clear the paperwork back and forth. It doesn't happen as often. It used to be all the time. Today it does not happen a lot in the business. Because people are saying, wait a minute, no, this is an important thing. I'm spending this kind of money on a house. I want you representing me. I want you representing me. So it doesn't happen as often. So no matter how sales associate compensation is structured, as a rule, only the employing real estate broker can pay it. Only the real estate listing broker gets paid at a closing. The listing broker pays the other broker out of his closing costs. Only the listing broker is usually the only agent at the closing. Sometimes the buyer agent will come to hold hands and make sure people are comfortable, but they'll never get a check at the closing. Only the selling agent will get a check at closing. Then the selling agent takes the check back, then they write the check to the other company. So the sellers are only paying one agent. Fee for services. You can do minimum level services. Um, some agents don't want to do the full package. They just want to advise. They just want to help people do this, this, or that step. And there are things called transactional agents. Ohio says no transactional agents. Ohio does not allow agents to do that. Other states do allow agents to be part, just part of the process, not doing the whole full package. But, again, this whole thing with Remax and how they sell and how they do, it's a little bit different than what a subsidy client does and what they offer the services, what the clients, their clients they're going to do. So that's all part of knowing who you're working for and how you're going to be doing your work that you need to be aware of. Antitrust laws. Again, price fixing. Realtors don't go to the board of realtor meetings and say, hey, everybody, we're going to charge 7%. They can't do that. They're not allowed to have that conversation. Um, you can't have group boycotting where people, okay? How many of you want to boycott the NFL right now? <laughs> okay? Because you're hearing all this stuff, okay? And it's all out there in the world. Anything social media you pick up, you're going to hear that. But realtors aren't allowed to, to take those kind of actions to group boycott people. We can't allocate customers. We can't say, oh, your territory is this and your territory is this and you're going to get this group and I'm going to get that group. We don't work that way either. We can't allocate markets. Years ago when you bought a McDonald's, literally when you bought a McDonald's franchise, Lou Groan, who invented the fish sandwich, by the way, anyone who don't know, Lou Groan had a uh, McDonald's on the west side of town. He invented the, the McDonald's fish sandwich. Why did he do that? Catholics on Friday wouldn't eat hamburgers. So he developed the fish sandwich. We used to joke with my nephew, you're going to get a sad meal. It's a fish sandwich and no fries. <laughs> but, so Lou Groan actually invented and pushed this fish sandwich through McDonald's corporate. They bought it. They decided it was a good product to have. At the time, Lou owned 39 McDonald's franchises in Greater Sustain Market. Because back when, McDonald's, when you're a franchisor, you bought a territory. Today, when you're a franchisor from McDonald's, it's one restaurant at a time. But years ago, they bought territories. Same kind of thing. In the real estate world, we don't buy territory. We don't say this is our territory. Now, Simpsy Klein has all these offices around Cincinnati, but they don't say to one branch of downtown, you can only work downtown, but you can't work Mount Adams. Okay? You can only work downtown, you can't work the west side, you can't work north side. They don't tell their agents that. Their agents, their office might be downtown. They do a lot of work downtown, but they can work wherever they want. It's what's close to them physically is where they're going to their office. Um, so, again, we don't allocate markets the same way. Tie-in agreements, we're not saying we're going to help you do this and do that. Okay, so tie-in agreements, what did you hear about the college coaches today? They're all being uh, prosecuted. 
because they were bribed and they were pointing students to agents, to marketing firms, to Adidas shoes, to different things like that. That's illegal in the business world. It's totally illegal in the real estate world too. We don't do those kind of things. Technology.